strike, communist realism, after an anti-retro reading of Marx. We're not depressed, we're on strike. The Invisible Committee, 2005. This paper challenges Mark Fisher's notion of communist realism through an anti-retro or new reading of Marx. This challenge takes as its starting point Fisher's dialectic understanding of communism as a politics that emerges from the very structures of a capitalist realist world which makes freedom impossible. The dialectical focus of this anti-retro reading of Marx is not the affirmation of class or socialist feminist or psychedelic or counter-cultural acid, co acid consciousness as it is for Fisher, but rather a negative critique of labour in capital. At the end of acid communism, Fisher describes the revolution as all power to living labour, but labour cannot be the basis for a new revolutionary collective subject as labour is the indifferent and ubiquitous organising principle of capitalist civilization. While capitalist realism denies the subjectivity of capital, the ultimate cause that is not yet a subject, capital, revolutionary theory after this anti-retro reading of Marx recognises capital as the revolutionary subject without an ego or a consciousness whose abolition constitutes the real problem of communism. The main revolutionary practice and principle for the problem of communism is strike, not the limited forms of industrial action that Fisher himself decries in capitalist realism, capitalist realism nor even the miners' strike, but strike prime, or women's strike, or earth strike, or social strike, after Plan C. Strike dissolves the social power of money and the state to create new forms of social value and individuality based on a politics of common purpose and social defence. The paper will present the development of a cooperative university across the UK as a form of self-managed organisation that comes out of the history of revolutionary struggles, a nostalgia for a lost utopian future grounded in the history of revolutionary struggles. A nostalgia for a lost utopian future grounded in a, common, a cooperative commonwealth. Social theory, not weird enough. So in this paper I want to engage with Mark Fisher, the social theorist, to respond to his provocations. My point is that whatever his powers and they are considerable as a teacher, public speaker, blogger, journalist, music, film and literary critic and writer. The theoretical framework on which he constructed his vision for universal liberation does not contain the dynamic energy to blast us out of the continuum of history into a world of red plenty. In other words, and in Fisher's words, his theory is not weird enough. In The Weird and the Eerie, he argues that the weird is the denaturalization of social life. The weird denaturalizes all worlds, exposing their instability and, uh, and their openness to the outside. But Fisher's, Fisher d does not denaturalize the social world of capital. Rather, in spite of his intuition, intelligence, imagination and integrity, he remains locked in a naive ontology of his own creation. I will further elaborate on what I mean by that with reference to three key concepts in Fisher's oeuvre. Capital, consciousness and communism. Anti-retro Marx. But before getting to Fisher's work, I want to say something about what I mean by anti-retro Marx. I get the term anti-retro from Simon Reynolds' introduction to K. Punk. Reynolds, as you know, was a longtime friend and collaborator of Fisher. Anti-retro means an aversion to cultural, 
aesthetic production, which recovers the past through pastiche and simulation, obliterating its heroisticity. Anti-retro, according to Reynolds and Fisher, means that historical forms of resistance exist as a hauntology for, for contemporary struggle, a failure to accommodate to the closed horizons of capitalist realism, what Marx calls the poetry of the future, or, as Fisher puts it, a nostalgia for a lost future. Anti-retro Marx is contra-orthodox Marxism. It's against orthodox Marxism. Orthodox Marx cast the proletariat as the revolutionary subject in a class war against the bourgeoisie. Orthodox Marx provides an economic theory that proves that alienated working classes are denied the full fruits of their labor, which must be restored through state planning in the first instance and eventually and inevitably in a social world dominated by living labor, as Fisher puts it, all power to living labor. There are, of course, elements of an affirmation of the working class in Marx's work, but the affirmation of living labor is not what constitutes Marx revolutionary science. And that's my main point. Anti-retro Marx looks to cover, looks to recover what is utterly revolutionary in Marx's work. And that's what I mean by weird. Anti-retro Marx emerges out of the subversive Marxisms of the early 20th century, restored by Adorno and his students and carried forward by various strands of Marxist scholarship in the 20th century, referred to as capital relation theory, open Marxism, critique of value, communization. The main paradigm of anti-retro Marx is a critique of political economy. Capital, value in motion, not labor, is the revolutionary subject without an ego or a consciousness. The struggle between capital and labor exists in the form of real violent abstractions, the commodity form, the money form, the state form, social forms of the value in motion's dynamic contradiction. Labor is a form of capital. Capital is a form of labor. The communist imperative is implicit in this capacity for capital to create abundant wealth, undermining the basis of its own existentiality, or everything that exists, capitalist civilization. The revolution is not the affirmation of oppressed social classifications, race, class, or gender, but the abolition of capital and its classifications. There are traces of all of this in Fisher's work. The frustrating aspect uh, is they are never worked up into a systematic uh, theory. F Fisher is, to uh, use his critique of Derrida, a frustrating thinker. Fisher's theoretical position is a veritable theory rush, written as, as, a, as a swarm text, a compendium to continental philosophy and cultural studies. The main feature of his approach is its commitment to complexity, a mirror reflection of the world it claims to understand. Fisher, to his credit, and after, Walter Jam uh, uh, and after Frederick Jameson, he does see capital can be seen as a single organizing and structuring principle. That is to say, capital is a totalizing process. And this is what Hoffman describes as his retro Marxism. But his version of capital, let me call it postmodern Marxism, is so unsubstantial and unsubstantiated that it fails to contrib contribute to revolutionary science, adding yet another layer of distracting complexity. Let me now turn to the concepts in Fisher's oeuvre. Capital. Fisher's analysis of capital is disabled by his non-engagement with the critique of political economy. So he's not able to define capital's real nature. For Fisher, capital is ambient, hyper-abstract, an atmosphere, invisible, unnameable, plastic, an abstraction, or a concept that is real but not a real abstraction. Where Fisher describes capital in more concrete terms through an analysis, 
based on modes of regulation, Fordism and post-Fordism, the rationality of these regulatory models is overstated. A problem for the theory of regulation in this way is the focus on institutional structures through which capitalism is regulated rather than resistance to that regulation and provides capital with a vision of the future which it cannot possess. Consciousness. A main feature of Fisher's political project towards the end of his life is raising class psychedelic or social this feminist consciousness. This is what he writes about in Acid Communism. But this critical reflection does not extend to consciousness itself. Consciousness is not denaturalized. Consciousness for Fisher is not, is not weird enough. Marxist anthropology has revealed consciousness, the capacity for, for conceptual thinking, as part of the structure itself of capitalist domination. Not the, content, not the content of thought, but the nature of thinking itself. I'm thinking, of course, particularly here, the work of so Alfred Son Rethel. Consciousness for Son Rethel emerged historically as the capacity required to classify, calculate, and make commensurate in a, non, in a rational way non-identical objects that need to be exchanged. That is to say, this, the process of exchange created literally a non-empirical reality. A non-empirical reality. This is a form of materiality that most of, of social science simply doesn't, doesn't understand or doesn't see. Non-empirical reality. This non-empirical form of thinking marks the origins, as Son Rethel has it, of the separation between manual and non manual or intellectual labor based on the capacity produce based on the capacity produce and the capacity to organize production so in this process of capitalist production it's not just the objects of labor that are alienated separated from their direct producers but the process of conceptual thought itself revolution therefore cannot be achieved by raising consciousness, as this leads only to a further intensification of alienation, but rather the reconnection of intellectual and manual labor, or reappropriating the, alien the alienated knowledge of its direct producers, or a recovery of what Marx calls the general intellect, or the social brain, or general knowledge. Not then consciousness raising, of whatever type, but rather, as Son Rethel said, tearing consciousness down. Communism. The limits of Fisher's social theory is not just a theoretical problem, but manifest in his policy uh, prescriptions. Uh, for, uh, for Fisher, I think uh, uh, for Fisher, communism is a reorganization of and redistribution of resources rather than the creation of new forms of social wealth. It's a redistribution of, of resources rather than the creation of new forms of social wealth not yet invented. So at the end of uh, acid communism, he reproduces a list developed by autonomous Marxist very much grounded in a labor ontology, that idea of living labor. And the affirmation of labor is made concrete in a series of what are, I think, quite timid proposals he developed with Jeremy Gilbert in the manifesto to reclaim modernity beyond markets, sorry, beyond machines. And this report includes cooperation, leaving the social relations of, of, of capitalism intact, Cooperation as a values-based movement, leaving any understanding of Marx's labor theory of value untouched. And democracy, which is disabled by uh, an understanding which thinks of politics and economics as if they exist in separate spheres. So coming towards the end of my talk now, I want to talk about strike. And how all this, or how we think about this in terms of creating a cooperative university. Um, so, strike. 
is an attempt in practical, real terms to connect intellectual and manual labour in a process that I call strike prime. Not strike to defend jobs, but to abolish the social relations of capitalist production. Capital is already abolishing itself through automation, resource depletion, including human and non-human life in the process of abolishing itself. And I, I talk about strike prime, but I know that Plan C have got a similar uh, idea or, or strategy, um, which they refer to as social strike. So I'll be interested to hear what Kia and others say about this. The notion of strike takes its inspiration from the early cooperators associated with the cooperative movement in the 19th century. They were driven by a utopian communistic process to take control of the means of production for labour against capital. A cooperative enterprise is owned and managed by its members, in the case of the university students and academics, for the benefit in society as a whole to produce uh, a new form of social value and, uh, and, and common wealth. I don't have much time to say about the cooperative university right now. Hopefully I can say more about that in question, but it is actually happening as a fact, um, taking advantage of new legislation. We are establishing a cooperative university uh, with degree awarding powers run by academics and students together. I'll say a bit more about that in questions, but let me just get um, one concern on the theory aspect. I've got three or four minutes left. In our work on the cooperative university, which I do with Joss Wynne, we make an explicit connection to this anti-retro reading of Marx um, in which capital rather than labour is the revolutionary subject. And in this work, and this is a bit of art created by a student for us, we describe this revolutionary process as the value vortex to illustrate the dynamic contradiction that sustains the capital relation and its institutional forms, including the capitalist university. Fisher's work, I think, contains no revolutionary dynamic principle other than what he refers to after Rousseau as the general will, a rather vague appeal for political consensus motivated by an economist, uh, economistic attraction to the politics of desire. The value vortex, on the other hand, shows the source of contradiction and crisis emerging from within the capital relation. Not labour and capital as separate forms, but as constitutive elements of the value form. The value form is materialised as class struggle, contained for now by capitalist public and private regulation, leading to the emergence of new radical social movements as well as socially useful knowledge. The value vortex generates concepts of resistance, alternative organisation models and traditional pathways to communism, sorry, transitional pathways. The value vortex is presented in this way to illustrate the point that it is theoretically and practically possible to recalibrate the value, the capital relation, whereas value in motion, abstract labour, rather than labour rather than labour and capital is the focus for revolutionary struggle. Not to affirm labour, but to abolish labour in all its forms and establish new types of social value. Finally, finally, suicided by society. Fisher's right. The way to avoid social suicide is by action. In The Optimism of the Act, in 2006, he acknowledges that capitalism is not sustainable and can be overcome. He takes a lesson from how to overcome capital from therapy for clinical depression. The best action therapy, he says, is to do things, even though the patient will, at the time, think any act is pointless and meaningless. And so the way out of cultural depression is to act as if things can be different. So yes, I agree, he's right. But act in a way that's reasoned, in a, that's grounded in a reasoned analysis of the world. Pointless and meaningless, I think, are the outcomes of a naive ontology, a, a, a fundamental failure to understand the relationship between intellectual labour, consciousness, the pure intellect, and manual living labour, labour in all its forms, including social reproduction. So let's act to reconnect intellectual and manual labour. That's the point of the cooperative university, to bring the intellect down to earth. Not to privilege labour or intellectual labour, but to abolish labour as a form of generalised human activity, 
capitalist work in which the intellectual can be separated from the manual. So not living labour, but the abolition of labour in all its forms. That's what I mean by strike. That's what I call weird. Mm -hmm.